about six, six in the morning. Yes, it will be this evening. Yes, saving for tomorrow. All right, so quickly, so we know that water is a polar molecule. So let's just draw back the structure of water. So we know that water, the chemical formula is H2O. But in terms of structure, it looks like this, right? Now, you need to remember the properties of water. But the properties of water, even when we say water is polar, it's because of a major factor. It is able to form hydrogen bonds, right? And it is able to form hydrogen bonds because it is polar. Quickly, what does it mean to be polar? Oxygen, it's an electronegative atom. So we know that oxygen is a non-metal, hydrogen is a non-metal. So when two non-metals form a bond, it's covalent bonding. Because oxygen, so if you haven't done chemistry in CSEC, oxygen is electronegative. All this means, right? When the oxygen and the hydrogen form a bond, they are sharing electrons. However, the electrons are very close to this oxygen. So the oxygen, the oxygen atom, it will have a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen will have a slightly positive charge. All right, so in a molecule of water, the oxygen atom, it carries a slightly positive charge, sorry. The oxygen atom, it carries a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen carries a slightly positive charge. So the negative and the positive ends, we refer to them as poles, all right? So the oxygen, we have a negative pole here and the hydrogen, we have a positive pole. So, the, so we have a dipole. So in the molecule of water, we have a dipole. So the term polar is used when, so will you be, yes, I will be uploading it. So the, the term polar, so could we do module three? I wanted to do that in the morning, try to cook it on module two. So polar simply because it has a dipole. So water is polar as a result. Remember, this is just recap. I'm going to move a little fast. All right. What is going to happen now? If you have a next molecule of water, Students, remember to mute the mic. Right, so this right here, that is your hydrogen bond. All right, this is your hydrogen bond. So if you are asked to represent it, they're going to use broken lines between a hydrogen atom of one water molecule and the oxygen atom of a next water molecule. This hydrogen bond here, that is your intermolecular force. Hey, lock off that.
So in water, the intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding, all right? That is represented by your broken lines between a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom of different water molecules, all right? So every property that we're going to explain for water is because it, one, it is polar, and two, because of hydrogen bonding. All right, so moving on, let's look back at some properties of water. So remember, if you're out of the structure of water showing the hydrogen bonding, this is what you would do. Right? The solid line are the actual bonds within the molecule, the broken ones, that is your inter molecular force of attraction. Can I erase the bodies? Anybody writing? Nobody? All right. All right, so these are the properties of water that we must remember. The first three, the first three, not the first three, actually all of these has to do with hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonds are relatively strong bonds. So to break them, it requires a lot of heat. So the reason if you have the properties of water, if you notice everything is high, specific heat capacity, high latent heat, of fusion, vaporization, surface tension, cohesion. So high strong cohesive force, cohesion is the ability of one water molecule to bond to the next one, which I just showed you, right? That's because of hydrogen bonding. So cohesion is just water molecules bonding together. That's because of hydrogen bonding. Specific heat capacity, is basically you are trying to raise the temperature of a substance. So if water has a high specific heat capacity, it requires a lot of heat to change the temperature of water by a degree Celsius. So that is very important because if the temperature of water raise quickly, then it will change easily from a liquid to a gas, right? So for purposes of water, just remember this. The reason why water is a good solvent, example for ionic compounds, water is polar. So water is a polar solvent. That means it can dissolve polar solutes like your ionic compounds, all right? So just remember your properties and that it is a good solvent. I'm going to pick out this one quickly or a past paper. I surface tension. So certain insects, I'm going to erase the board now if no one is writing. Can I erase the board? All right. No, I'm just, yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir.
So when you look at the a body of water, right, at the surface, they say it appears like you would say a skin because of its strong cohesive force gives rise to surface tension. Now, certain animals, or well, not animals, insects, right? I don't remember the exact name of the insect, but they are able to glide on the water. So, Sir, water striders. Right. So, if they are in terms of surface tension, one important feature of it, certain insects are able to glide on the surface of the water, and that's because of the strong surface tension. So it's surface tension where things can open the water. But surface tension is also because of the strong cohesive forces, right? The next point that typical points we would ask about is in terms of ice. What is the importance of density when it comes to water? So we know that when water freezes, it becomes a solid, right? Normally, a solid object, right, is denser than a liquid. But water is the opposite. Ice is less dense than water. That means when a body of water freezes, the water freezes from the top. Right, so I'm switching now from surface tension, where we are looking at now the importance of the density of water when it's a liquid versus when it is a solid. So when it freezes, because ice is less dense than water, it freezes from the top. All right, so this is representing ice. And so what it does, it acts as an insulator for the water below. And so sea creatures, they are able to survive when the time is extremely cold. So because ice is less dense, when the water freezes, it freezes from the top. And that creates a layer above the surface of the water. And so whichever animal is beneath, they are able to survive. All right, is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the last one. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Someone is asking, asking if it could go over, please. All right, so simply, so ice, if you put, even if you notice, right, if you take ice and put it in a glass of water or juice, it is at the top. That's because ice is less dense than water. So when it is, when water is freezing, it freezes at the surface first. So like in large bodies of water, right? When it freezes, so it freezes at the top and not from below coming up. So it actually acts like an insulator so that organisms below, they can still survive when the time is extremely cold. Right? So right now the properties and how we can relate its importance. And the last one is water obtained as a solvent. So we're going to use sodium chloride as the example. Sodium chloride is a, in sodium chloride, the sodium is positive, the chloride ion is negative. What will happen? The oxygen atom of water, it will bond to the positive sodium ion. All right, so the oxygen atoms, they will run to the sodium ion. And the hydrogen ions, which are slightly positive, 
will be attracted to the chloride ion. So why is water a good solvent? Water is a good solvent because it is polar, it is able to dissolve polar solutes. So the water molecules, they are going to surround the mm -hmm. ionic compound and mm -hmm. break the bond. Mm -hmm. So what is going to happen? Water molecules surround the sodium ion and water molecules surround the chloride ion and they pull them apart. And so the bond that exists between sodium and chloride, it breaks. Yo, don't bother coming and saying, I don't want to chat in there. Yeah. Right? So water is a good... We're looking at the properties of water, but for some of them, you will have to explain more than others. So this one is why water is a good solvent, all right? So the reason why it is a good solvent, it is polar, so it can dissolve polar solutes. And the example we're looking at is the ionic compound, sodium chloride. So the sodium ion is positive, the chloride ion is negative. So the oxygen atoms of water, which are negative, they will surround the positive sodium ion and the hydrogen ions, which are slightly positive, will surround the chloride ion. All right. Then now that attraction between the sodium and the oxygen is pulling this sodium apart and the attraction of the chloride ion with it a lot of the hydrogen ions of water. So chloride is attracted to hydrogen of water. Sodium is attracted to oxygen. And so they pull the molecule apart. And so the bond that kept sodium chloride together, it is broken. And when that happens, the molecule will appear, and I say appear, to dissolve because you will still have the sodium and the chloride ion present. So if you actually boil salt water long enough, the water will evaporate and you will get back sodium chloride. So it appears to dissolve because the water molecules from the different ions. And so that is how water acts as a solvent for your polar compounds. If the compound is non-polar, there will be no attraction because non-polar means you don't have any holes. So no positive end, no negative end. So there is nothing to attract the water molecules. The reason why sodium is attracting oxygen, sodium is positive, the oxygen is slightly negative. So negative and positive attracts. So when the molecule is non-polar, it does not have a negative end, it does not have a positive end, so it cannot be attracted to water. Hence, if you put oil in water, the oil stays on top. There's no attraction because oil is non-polar. Water is polar, all right? So that is why water can dissolve your polar compounds. Just like with glucose, Glucose have a lot of oxygen molecules, sorry, oxygen atoms on it, and hydrogen, right? So it's polar. All right. So that is for water. I'm to try to wrap it up quickly. All right. So just remember to be able to list the properties of water. The high latent heat of fusion, vaporization specific, specific heat capacity. Yes, the OH makes it. Polar. So the high specific heat capacity, heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, all of those three are due to hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonds are relatively strong, so it requires a lot of heat to break it. 
the boiling point for water, as we know, is 100 degrees Celsius. All right. So let us try to draw some molecules now. So you have to remember to draw the different molecules and how to get the polymers. All right. So let us start by looking back at the structure of glucose. You must know how to draw the structure of glucose, by the way, right? Now, on the, when you get the on the exam, you don't have to see all of this on the exam. They can simplify it. If they simplify it, by the way, this is alpha glucose when the OH group on carbon one. So I'm just going to go. So in most the most likely scenario is that you will get a simplified structure for your molecules, in which case you won't see any hydrogen. Right. You won't see any hydrogen. So just remember, you must know the difference between alpha glucose and beta glucose. With alpha glucose, we are looking at carbon number one. So alpha glucose. For alpha glucose, the OH group is going to be pointing downwards. For beta glucose, don't do this. You won't do the exact same structure for glucose except that the OH group must be pointing up. So simply, right. so you don't have to get anything else on the diagram. But if you are asked to draw it in full details, then you have to put on everything on it. So you have to put the hydrogen. The OH group, so remember this is carbon number one. This is carbon number two. So the OH group is outside of the ring for carbon number two. And on the inside for carbon three. So this is alpha glucose and this is beta glucose on top. So the only difference is the position of your OH group. Alpha points down, beta points up. After glucose, let us look at our first type of reaction, which is condensation. So to get all of these, macromolecules that we will look at, starch, glycogen, cellulose. There are all polymers which are formed from condensation reactions. Hopefully you would have done chemistry in C6. Before I do the condensation reaction, so the two monomers, that we look at for K, fructose and glucose. So we just do glucose, so now I'm going to do fructose. I'm going to do just 
module one because I really don't have enough time tonight. I have to end rather quickly, but I'm going to work early. If you can wake up about six o'clock to somewhere after eight to nine, we're going to chill and do some just past papers, module two and three, and just work them based on the topic. All right, but for tonight, you don't really have much space at the time, all right? I'm just going to try and do as much as I can, all right? But it's very important for module one that you know your structures and how to draw them, all right? So we did glucose, let's just quickly look back at fructose. Right. And then, of course, so remember, you can get the simplified version where you don't see the hydrogens. All right, just the ring and these two groups that are important. This carbon here, this is carbon number one. So it's carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is fructose, all right? That's your monosaccharide. So the two monosaccharides are glucose and fructose. Now let us do our first disaccharide, which is sucrose. So once you start doing the disaccharides and polysaccharides, you must know the monomer that make them up and the type of glycosidic bond. So when we're looking at polymers or polysaccharides, they bond, so if you get your polysaccharides through condensation, polymerization. No, you don't have to know that one. For tomorrow, 6 a.m. So polymerization, we're enjoying up monomers. So your monosaccharides, those are called your monomers. And the polysaccharides, those are your polymer. So your journal, monosaccharides are the monomers, to get the polymers. Same thing. So the two monomers are monosaccharides, are glucose and fructose. Both of them are reducing sugars. And when you do, that is correct, glucose and fructose give you sucrose. When you did the two tests, I are doing reducing sugars, glucose and fructose, those are your monosaccharides. They have an aldehyde or ketone group, all right? Sucrose, it don't have that. So in the food test, yes, sucrose is a disaccharide. So in the food test, the same procedure for the reducing sugar is not the same for the non-reducing sugar, which is sucrose. And we have to add acid, and let us look at what happens and why we need that. So for food tests, you also have to remember your food tests and the different reagents. So to get sucrose, we need glucose and we need fructose. So it's a condensation reaction. 
and we need in condensation reaction, we're going to join up two compounds by removing a molecule of water. So we are going to remember water is H2O. So we're going to remove an hydroxyl group from one of the carbon atoms and the hydrogen from the next one. All right. So to join up glucose with fructose, we have to remove a molecule of H2O. So if you remove the molecule of H2O, this now, will, we are going to join these two by connecting this carbon with this oxygen, all right? So I'm just going to place the oxygen in the middle and do that, all right? And once you get this bond here, once you join up two sugar molecules, that bond, as we know, is a glycosylic bond. Sorry, can I repeat, please? Repeat the name of the bond or the process. The process. All right. So remember, glucose, because it's OH group, right? And carbon one. The fructose, it also has an OH group. I should make note that the glucose, the fructose molecule, it has been flipped. So this carbon here, this is actually carbon two. So in sucrose, the bond that is formed is between carbon one and carbon two, right? And so we will call it a one, two glycosylic bond. So the reaction, it is taking place between two hydroxyl groups, so the two OH groups, and ensure your oxygen is always the one that is attached to the carbon, not the hydrogen, all right? So what is going to happen? We need to join these two sugar molecules, right? But in order to do that, we need to remove a molecule of, of water. So let me put this oxygen in red. All right. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Isn't it a one for glycosylic bond? No, for sucrose, it's one, two. Sucrose is one, two. The molecule actually flip. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. So, right, that is why I was pointing out that this is not actually carbon four, it's carbon two. Sir, you can number the carbons, please. All right, so for this one, for glucose, this is carbon one. This is carbon two, three, four, five, and this is carbon six. Normally for sucrose, this is carbon one, this is carbon two. But when you are forming the disaccharide with glucose, this is actually, so, it, so this is actually carbon one. This carbon here is actually carbon two, carbon three, and it continues, all right? So just remember for sucrose, it's one, two, and not one, four. So all we need to do, right, to join up the two of them, we need to connect the carbon of the glucose to the oxygen of the fructose. So in order to do that, we need to remove the OH group from the carbon I mean, glucose, and we need to remove the hydrogen from the oxygen, all right? So we need to remove the OH group from the carbon and glucose, and we remove the hydrogen of the oxygen. So we remove two hydrogen and the oxygen, that's how we get water. And then now this carbon here, it can form a bond with this oxygen, right? And that is what happened. 
we are going to form a bond with this between the carbon and the oxygen. So this oxygen is what is used to join fructose with glucose, right? But to just make it up, right? The oxygen there, right? And that is a one, two glycosidic bond. Any sugar bond is called a glycosidic bond. So whether it's starch, glucose, sorry, starch, cellulose, maltose, any sugar bond, once it's formed, it's a glycosidic bond. And the numbers tell the two carbon atoms that are involved. So this is sucrose. All right, and when you're doing the food test, this bond here is broken. So this bond here, has to be broken. So it's acid hydrolysis. So if you break this bond, so what happens in the food test? When you break the glycosidic bond, you basically get back here monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. So after you add the acid, so you break it up. Then when you add the Benedict solution afterwards, you are basically adding the Benedict solution the two reducing sugars. So that is why you add the acid first to hydrolyze the glycosidic bond. So you can get back the two monosaccharides, is glucose and fructose. So that when you add the Benedict solution, you get a reaction. But if you had gone straight ahead and add it to this, you would not get a reaction. So for sucrose, very more likely, very more likely to use sulfuric acid than sir. Please repeat. Be more likely to use sulfuric acid than in this case. For the acid hydrolysis. Right. Yes, sir. I don't, I don't remember if the acid affected. I would which type of acid. So I'd have to check. But I know it's acid hydrolysis. I didn't really check if the type of acid would affect it. Mm. All right, sir. Yeah, but when you add the acid, it's to break the glycosidic bond. And so what that does is free up. So remember, glucose is actually a reducing sugar. So it must have an aldehyde group. So when you clean the glycosidic bond, those groups are free up to react with the Benedict's reagent. All right? And in Benedict's reagent, what is actually taking part in the reaction is actually copper two plus ions. So you must understand your, your reactions, all right? So in the Benedict solution, the key reagent is copper two ions, Cu2 plus ions. And these are blue, all right? When we say reducing sugars, it's because it will actually reduce something. So the copper two ions, they will be reduced to copper one, all right? Which is when you get the, when you would see the characteristic brick red color, all right? It's actually copper Sorry. ions, copper two going to copper one. Sir, can you repeat that, please? Sir, can you repeat that, please? All right, so in the Benedict solution, right, when you add it to a reducing sugar, the reason why you get that blue to brick red color, the key reagent in the Benedict solution is copper 2 ion Cu2 plus. Now, glucose and fructose, those are reducing sugars, all right? So they are going to reduce your copper two plus ions to Cu plus. So from copper two to copper one. Copper two is the reason why Benedict's solution is blue. That is what gives the Benedict's solution its blue color. So if the copper two ions is reduced from two plus, to plus, 
then the solution can no longer appear blue if there is no CO2 plus ions present anymore. When you're Benedict's test, you are going from blue to a brick red color because the copper two ions are being reduced to CO2 plus. Okay, so you're saying, saying that the copper two plus is being reduced by the presence of the sugar. Right. Okay, sir. So also, right? The reason how remember your Benedict's solution, right? When you are testing for sugar, if you are doing a quantitative test, right? You don't have to get a brick red color. Once you get a color change from blue, even to green. That's a sign of sugar. So, blue, uh, just a second, somebody's mic is killing me. Right, so once you get the, once you get a color change, as long as it change from blue to green, sugar is present. What affects the intensity of the color change is the amount of sugar that is present. If you don't have enough sugar, you cannot reduce enough of these to get enough of these. So if, it, if a small amount of sugar is present, only a small amount of the copper two ions will be reduced. So you will not get a brick red color. You might get a green or a yellow color. So that is why the food test can be used. That is why we say semi-quantitative. We can use it to estimate the amount of sugar present in a sample. If you get a brick red color, it would mean that a lot of sugar is present because it is enough to reduce a large amount of your Cu2 plus ions. No man, once you get a color change, even if, even if it is from blue to green, it means that reducing sugar is present because it is reducing your copper two plus ions. If it goes to red, it means you have a lot of the sugars present. If you don't have enough sugar, you won't reduce enough. <laughs> All right, so quickly, so we can move on. Let us say it takes 10 sugar molecules to cause a blue to brick red color change. Let us say it takes five of it to change it from blue to yellow and two sugar molecules to change it from blue to green. So if only two sugar molecules are present, you will get a green color. Start at eight. No, the class will be recorded and I have some other stuff to do, do as well. So I will just be doing the class and record it. All right. So even if no one wakes up, I just start at six and post it afterwards. All right. All right. So quickly, I want to say that this is, can be used to quantitatively determine it. The more reducing sugar, the more intense the color. Exactly. That is what I'm saying. The more sugar you have, the more intense the color because you are reducing more of these. So the more of copper one you get is the more intense the color. So if you get a small amount of copper one, you probably get a yellow color. If you get a lot of it, you get a brick red color. All right. So I was just mentioning that sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. You add the acid to it. And please remember this. You add the acid to break the the glycosidic bond and the YouTube channel. Anybody in here has the link and post it for me. In the chat, the link to the channel. I'll post it for you, sir. All right, thanks. Right, so the reason why you add the acid because you can get a table and experiment with an osmosis or food test or some other experiment. All right, if you get food test, you need to know why you use each reagent. So hydrochloric acid, break the glycosidic bond. All right, let's look at the next. So the only disaccharide that we need to know is sucrose. So you must be able to enjoy it. The monosaccharides were glucose and fructose. 
Now we're going to move to our solid saccharides, glycogen, starch, and cellulose. All right, so remember, glucose is a one, two, sorry, sucrose, one, two, glycosidic bond between sucrose, sorry, between glucose and fructose. All right, so the next one now is, let's look at starch. So starch is made up of glucose and fructose. Sorry, just glucose, but it is made up of two separate polymers, amylopectin and amylose. So I'm just going to draw a quick section of starch. So starch is made up of amylopectin and amylose. However, both amylose and amylopectin, there are also polymers of glucose. So I'm going to do two of them. And there are each of them, each polymer, both amylopectin and amylose, they are joined by alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds. All right, so let us draw some glucose molecules. And I'm going to skip the condensation process and just show the glycosidic bond. So remember, this is carbon one and each glucose molecule. So this is also carbon one. Oops. So starch is made up of amylose and amylopectin. In amylose, we have one four, one four glycosidic bonds. In amylose, we also have one four glyco. Glycosidic bonds. All right. But for starch, the bonding starch alpha is their alpha. All right. They are both alpha. However, the bonding in starch is one six. So for starch, it's one six. The reason why it's one six. Starch is made up of amylopectin and amylose. If you notice, this is carbon one and it is bonded to carbon six. So it is carbon one of one of the polymers joined to carbon six of the next one. So it's one six for starch. So for amylose and amylopectin, it's one four. So each of them are their individual chains, but when they are connecting to each other, 
it's carbon one and carbon six. So in starch, you have one six glycosidic one. So say that one more time, please. Just a second. So starch is a polymer, but unlike when you get, unlike when we do fructose, not fructose, sucrose, where see the individual monomers are even like when you see cellulose, when we're about to do cellulose, and it's just made up of one type of monomer, starch is actually made up of two different polymers, all right? So starch is a little different where the other polymers are made up of monomers. But starch is actually made up of two different polymers. So aminopectin is a polymer, amylose is a polymer. Both of them are made up of glucose units that are linked together by one, four glycosidic bonds, all right? But so, they are just, yes. So say like um, um, starch is made up of amylopectin and amylose, but like amylose is the branched, um, it's the branched polymer, whatever, and amylose is unbranched. Right. So that is when they get to the reaction with iodine, and they mention. I don't know if you read of the chemistry of the reaction, the interaction between iodine and starch is actually with the amylose part, which is more. Branch Wait, is, is with the amylopectin part or the amylose? Which one is um, the amylose is the one that from the parent? The yeah. amylose is the unbranched amylose. one. Amylose is the unbranched one. That means it's interact with the amylopectin, the branch version of it. Okay. Right. All right. So right. So even though it is starch, it is the one that is branched. So the amylopectin, it is interacting. So it's not like it just interacting with starch and a whole. All right, it will interact with the branch chain. Good. So what I was pointing out is that amylopectin is a polymer. Amylose is also a Excuse polymer. Excuse me, sir, could you please repeat? The part about iodine? Are, no, what's on the board? All right, so we're looking at the, the polymers now. So we're doing starch, glycogen, and then cellulose. So normally your polymer is made up of monomers, which are simple units joining up. So just like amylose, so due to space, I would draw more of these, right? But for amylopectin, it's different glucose units just joining up together to form a long chain. The same thing goes for amylose, right? Glucose units, one for glycosidic bonds, they join up together. Where starch comes in to get starch, we need to link amylopectin with amylose. And how we link them is between carbon one and carbon six. So carbon one in one of the polymers, right, to carbon six. So starch is branched. So glucose carbon number one, so it's two chains, one up top, one below, linked by carbon one and carbon six. So right here, this one here, this is the bond for starch. That's the glycosidic bond for starch. Carbon number one to carbon number six. These bonds here, that's your one four glycosidic bond. And the next one in amylose. Is that clear? Hey, let me in. Yes, sir. Very clear. Yes, sir. Unically, yes, sir. All right, so that is what you will do first of all. <laughs> Or can I erase and move on? Or uh, somebody join? Wait, sir, I need to take a screenshot. All right, no problem.
And I can hear us now? Yes, sir. All right. But the real one pass, you know, the more pass. All right, they can root back a minute now. So remember your mic is on you. So glycogen for glycogen is simple. Right, so for glycogen, it's just like with your amylose or amylopectin, meaning it is made up of glucose units joined by one, four glycosidic links. All right, so it's just simply alpha one four glyco skinny links. You can put link or bond. Mm -hmm. So there's a link or bond, it's the same thing. So alpha one four glyco skinny links. That's uh, glucose. Sorry, that's glycogen. Need to be some all right. Sir, so, um, isn't that That's this called, like a branch molecule as well? A branch yes. like polymer. Right. But it has yeah. it has more branch than amylopectin. Yeah, glycogen is also branch. So I'm going to put that when I'm I'm going to write a little description shortly for each of the polymers. All right. So I'm going to do cellulose now. I can I can raise the board. Not as yet. Too. No, sir. Oh, all right. No problem. I was just checking. All right. Can't erase them. All All right, so cellulose is beta, is made up of beta glucose. That means the OH group on carbon one should be pointing upwards. All right. 
also in cellulose, each glucose molecules, they flip 180 degrees. So I'm starting with this one in, let's say the upright condition, right? So but that means the next molecule, beside of it, it must flip over. So if you flip this over, the CH2 group here, it comes down. And the oxygen that is here, comes here. So we are flipping it. All right, so the CH2 group here, it comes here. All right, hence, you see I have CH2OH here. And the oxygen that is here, so we basically bring it down. Hence, you see it here. All right. Remember, carbon one, the OH group is pointing upwards, right? So I'm just going to show the bond. All right. Let me hear this here. Sir? Yes? On the example, they ask us to draw them separately or draw them um, after the reaction. They can ask. They can just ask to draw a section of cellulose, right? In which case, yes, you would do this, right? So this one is upright, and so we should this one. That means the next one in line now must go upright again. Let me see if I can make it whole. So this one. All right, so the key feature with cellulose is that the molecules rotate 180 degrees, one after the other. So that is why you see this one pointing upwards and this one pointing downwards. All right, I remember it is made up of beta glucose. So it is still one for glycosylic bond but it's not alpha glucose, it is beta. So it is beta one four glycosidic links, which rotates at 180, both of them. So each time you draw a glucose molecule, it must rotate 180 in comparison to the next one. All right, let me do this. Let me draw back glycogen so that you can see the rotation. So you notice in this one below, all of the molecules are in the same position, but with glucose, if you're starting, if you're starting it in cellulose, if you're starting with glucose in this position, right? The next glucose molecule in line, no, it's still one four. So look, this, the molecule, we are flipping it one, in, so we are not flipping it sideways, right? We are flipping it over. So this is carbon one, and so this is carbon six, carbon five, carbon four, all right? So it's still taking place between carbon one and carbon four. It's just that this molecule here, when you join it back here, it must be, flipped over. So the CH2 group, just so you don't get confused, right? This CH2 group here, just right below it, right? 
right? CH2 OH, right? Right below it, the same carbon directly below it. Right? So let me just point it out. This carbon directly below it, you put CH2OH. And below the oxygen, right? Right of oxygen. Good. So in your new molecule, this is where the CH2OH must be. And this is where the oxygen must be. And it's then now, sir. yes? Sir, so what are the Jordan at the bottom down this, is, sir? This here or this? Yes, sir. That. This one? Oh, okay. Yes, right, so somebody was just asking about what is being rotated. So I just drew this for glycogen. So showing that this one all the, all the molecules are exactly the same. Nothing is being flipped or Everything is the same. So, so you are just making a comparison between cellulose and glycogen. Right. So I want them, them to see that with this one, after each glucose molecule that they are joining, they are flipping in opposite directions. So this one is carbon six was up here. So the next glucose I draw it must be pointing downwards. And then the next one I draw it must be pointing upwards. And so the next one will be pointing downwards. So also if you look at the glycos three bonds, it's up, down, up, down, where I'm showing that they are rotating or flipping a 180 degrees flip. All right. What is in red is so that if you find it confusing as in how to flip it, once you draw this one, the CH2 group, you just draw a broken line directly below it, right? And put CH2OH. So when I join the new glucose molecule, your CH2OH must be in this exact position, which is what I have here. And then we have the O in this one, in the new glucose molecule, it should be directly below it. That is why I have it here. So before it was here, so now I have it here. Before the CH2OH was here, and now I have it directly below it. So it basically flip over. All right. And then now for the next one, it's the same thing I'm doing. If the CH2 is here, in the next one, it should be up here. And if the O is down here, it should come back up here, which is what you see over here. The CH2OH, it comes back up here as well as the oxygen. So that is how you flip it, 180. All right? So for cellulose, it is beta 1 for glycosidic bond, but you have to remember to flip it. Right, because all the OH and so forth, right, we just use this simplified version of it. Right? So the OH and all the hydrogen and so forth, no. All right, just the simplified one. All right, so that is so we look at cellulose, look at starch, we look at glycogen, all right, those are the three polysaccharides. Yes, I did the. One six already. Sir, could you label them, please? The carbon atoms, like number one, two, three? No, sir. Which one is cellulose? Which one is starch? So we did starch already. So this one is cellulose. Right. Oh, this one that I drew again, this would be glycogen mm -hmm. and glycogen uh, is alpha glucose sir right? yes somebody is asking if we can draw the simplified version that you're drawing right now for the exam yeah man All right. unless you say unless they say give the full detailed structure which they will only do that if they want 
a monosaccharide. Right? But for, for the polymers, it's the simplified version. Even when they are giving you, you will see the simplified one. Okay? But if they're adding to a uh, monosaccharide, look at what they are. If they ask for the detailed structure, then I have to put on the OH ring. Oh! It's your You go, man. All right, so I'm just going to put some information on the board for the three polymers as it relates to their structure and function. Question, sir. Yes. Sir, what school do you teach at, sir? Please repeat. Sir, what school do you teach at? Merle Grove. Oh, Jano. Sir, no one's sending an application for almost, sir. Yeah, so that one. Can I do my Crazy. Yeah, well. Sir, where's almost done, sir? No, my man, I can't. No, but see, I can't do my that. Like, yeah. I can't ask that. Like, yeah. You know? We have a regular student in here. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I don't know the thing where it is. Lisa said that said yes if they were here. No, I'm just saying you can't ask them. Sir, we can put in a word here, no, sir. What, what's your name, sir? Mr. Here. Mr. Here, all right. Sir. Mm -hmm. Put in a word here, sir. Yes, sir, real time. I'll, I'll definitely speak to Mr. Phoenix, the principal of the Walmart Boys School, to reach out to you know, because uh, um, this, this learning thing never did work before this session. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, so hey, it didn't work. <laughs> let's just put some information on the board. All right, let's see. All right, and for yesterday, I just I didn't get to reply to any email, unfortunately. All right, so sorry about that to the pick. So I was supposed to send some answers and I didn't get to. All right, so sorry about that. All right, so for cellulose, they will ask you, like, relate really the structure to the function, all right? So I'm just giving you some concise info that you can remember easily. All right, so.
All right, so if they ask you to relate the structure of cellulose to its function, the function of cellulose, right, is for support in the plants, as you know, like in the cell wall of plants, right? So the role, it just make these three pointers made up of around 10,000 beta glucose units. The molecules, especially in this one, these two, these two points, they form long and branch chains and run parallel to each, to each other and having cross linkages between them. Um, so I could also do a topic on like the reactivity between the different polymers, because right? they always ask about what makes, uh, why right. is... So yeah. like sucrose, why it makes it a uh, good, why it's a good transport material versus like glucose. Right? Yes, so they can ask question like that. Right, but most of, I didn't get any chance to prepare any questions or stuff. So, so, sir, how would you answer that question? Which one? The one that you just asked. Oh, it's so good. Sir. Yeah, yeah. that one. So, sir, all these questions, sir, we're going to do it tomorrow, sir. Same link. So, right. But, so, now we're So, I'm going to look for some past papers specific to these. So, I'm going to wake up before six and look up some and stuff. So, for six, we just start go through them. All right. There's a module one alone here, cover, sir. I'm going to do DNA replication, just the replication, because I really don't have a lot of time tonight. It's because I canceled last night, so I know I couldn't cancel tonight again, because I wanted so, to. So, sir, tomorrow, sir, in the morning, sir. So, um, we, we, we will be doing past papers on all the topics that they gave us. Right. right. So I'm about six. I'll try to go to nine o'clock because I have to do some stuff after it. So about three hours. All right. And we we'll see as much as we can do. All right. All right, sir. Okay, so we just get the structures out the way. And I'm going to touch DNA replication. And then we close for tonight. And then 6 a.m. morning. All right. So this is the info for cellulose. Let's just write the info for glycogen and starch. In the morning, we will work, we're going to work questions on this. All right. Yes, I'm going to use this, this same link. All right. So as soon as you're finished with this info, you'll let me know. So I think we can continue. All right. So I'm going to do glycogen. So the, the cross link thing that you had to the uh, you're saying that the cellulose chain uh, are parallel and cross-link is that right. due to like hydrogen bonds the cross-linking right yeah yes that is correct so because the oh groups which are sticking off as i yes, showed sir. you with right as i showed you with the the water molecules the oxygen atom is attracted to the hydrogen the slightly yeah, positive, the hydrogen right so 15 percent all right all right, so glycogen is the major storage. So as we know, glycogen and starch as a storage role and cellulose as a structural role. If you notice, cellulose is not branched. Cellulose is unbranched. Starch and glycogen are branched. So major storage 
police apparel. So they were very reactive. That is correct. Well, not very good. Reactive enough. So because of the highly branched nature of it, because remember, as I said, their main, their main function is for storing energy. So we need to be able to break it down. box. So remember, when I eat a lot of- So like, so like it, it, it's, it's easier to break down than uh, sucrose. And cellulose too. As and cellulose. Cellulose, right. Uh, highly, highly branched. So it is highly branched, so we can get the energy from it easily. So we can break it down to glucose, and then once we get glucose, we know that glucose goes into cellular respiration. Sir, I have a question. Sure. Sir, so you're saying the difference between alpha and beta glucose is the positioning of the hydroxide group. So right, what's the, the significance group. of the what's the, what's the significance of one point pointing upward versus one pointing downwards? No, well, they just attribute the they just give it in the internal of the, the significance of one pointing up and one pointing down in terms of forming the structures. Yes. Are you mean are in terms of a role? Like if yes, it affects sir. the function. The linkages and stuff like that. Right. Now the function would come from so the major difference in terms of function of these polymers is whether they are branched versus unbranched. So if you notice when cellulose, the unbranched version, it's harder to break down. Because this is a revision class. It, I won't go into the chemistry, but when it's long and, and unbranched, remember if it is breaking down or dissolving, water is involved. And if it's branched, water molecules are more able to interact with it to break it down. But with cellulose, the long unbranched nature of it, that will not happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With that, sir, it's that amylose is harder to break down than glycogen then. Because you know, amylose need like a specific enzyme to break it down. Right. Amylase. Right. And it's the amylose, this the amylopectin that is the more highly branched version of it. So it's right. So that is how we much the structure to the function. So branched, the branched one are more used for energy as an energy reserve. The unbranch is more of a structural, structural role. All right, so the last one, let's just look starch. I don't want to do protein. I'm just going to do starch, just a second. Let me see. It's not it I'm actually just going to do starch and then we'll look at DNA replication. In the morning, we look at the structure of phospholipid and protein. All right, because I want to look at DNA replication that tends to be a little difficult for students. All right, so storage.
And we know that starch is the plant equivalent to, to glycogen. So it's a form of excess So when amyl affecting gets in the body, so what, what does the body do with it? A starch. What is starch? Okay, remember, we get it. So if it's, you need basic digestion, right? Well, not basic, in the season. So the end product of starch, whether, it's, whether we say starch or carbohydrate, what is the end product of it? So the end product would be glucose, so you get glucose right. at the end. Yes. But like, so so remember they say like it's amylase enzyme break it down. So well, what about the amylopectin? Amylase break down the amylopectin as well. Right. There's more than one enzyme actually. Oh. That acts on it. Yeah. So it's amylase still, but they have different class of it. But after you get the amylase, we actually get it down to maltose and then maltase break down the maltose into glucose. So I'll run through that again real quick. Also, this, the malt, the amylase, it breaks down the starch, but it goes as far as the maltose, which is a disaccharide. And then maltase breaks, breaks up the maltose into glucose. There's a different enzyme that actually make it get the get it the glucose from the start. Okay, sir. All right, so in the morning, we will look at the rest of like protein, amino acids, how they are linked, and first one, the big book. I want to touch on the replication before in the morning. All right, so we are working. DNA replication. What is the purpose of replicating our DNA? Our DNA is replicated semi-conservatively. What does that mean? Right. All right, variation. One old strand and one new strand. A new strand. Parent has one strand and the new strands. All right, so just a second. I'm just answering. Someone knows. So remember in photosynthesis, the product is glucose. But the excess glucose, if you have too much of it, it is converted to starch. So when you look at plant cells and you see those granules, I would say those are starch granules. And if it was animal, glycogen granules. So starch grain are glycogen granules. So the excess, any excess glucose that is present, it is converted into the polymer starch, all right? So when we say reserve food for excess glucose, it is the form in which excess glucose is stored, all right? All right, so let's go back to the glucose now. Let's quickly look at the replication of it. So DNA, we have discontinuous and continuous replication. And in explaining DNA replication, we talk about leading strand and lagging strand. 
So for this continuous, so we have leading strand and lagging strand. And we can refer to replication as being continuous and one as being discontinuous. Each of those processes refers to the strands. So we have leading strand, lagging strand. Discontinuous replication and continuous replication. Which strand does continuous replication and which one does discontinuous replication? The discontinuous and lagging. lagging. Right. So we know that DNA, two strands. So let us put our two strands of DNA. And we know one runs five prime to three prime, and one runs three prime to five prime. Which one, what is the direction of our leading strand? Three to five. Three to five. Three to five. Three to five. Yeah. Sure. Five prime to three prime. Five prime to three prime. Five prime to three prime. That is correct. But it's also five prime to three prime in the direction of the replication part, right? So remember, DNA is coming. So you can repeat that, sir. So it's not just five prime to three prime. It's five prime to three prime in the direction of what we call the replication part. So, so, so you're saying the leading strand, so the leading strand is five prime to three prime? Right. But in the direction of which the DNA opens up. So let me just show you what I mean, right? So DNA is quite so, right. Yes. So, um, uh, um, so in, in my in, in my notes say it says like the the leading strands like three prime to five prime but DNA polymerase works to, to produce five prime to three prime no, you know complementary strands. Okay. But the lawyer was no so the leading strand all right uh, when we do it let us do it and we'll see which one is the leading strand, all right? All right, sir. So, so let us see if it's five to three or three to five, all right? So this is our DNA. It's normally kind of, right? So we know that an enzyme will come and unwind it, right? Break the hydrogen bond. Which which enzyme does that? Helicase. Helicase. Right, that is correct. So if you break the, right, if it, Breaks the hydrogen one, a portion of your DNA will open up, right? And the part that opens up, that is what we call the replication part. No, all of your DNA will not open up at the same time. A portion of it will open. All right, so let me see. This, all right, so let's say with this one, fire prime. Three prime, and so this one will be three prime, and then this one will be five prime. All right, I'm just carrying it a little. So, if this is where the DNA opens up, so the DNA is opening up in this direction, right? That means the new strand of DNA is going to be made in this direction. All right, let me just put on some bases. Now, question before we continue, in what direction? So what you must not get confused with is the direction of the leading strand and the direction in which DNA is made because both of them will sound five to three. So the leading strand run five to three. In what direction is in what direction is DNA made? Three to five. Three to five. Mm -hmm. DNA is made five to three. Three to five to three. Sir, right. five to three. So, sir, right. so, so, so the leading strand, sir, 
would be because from three prime to five prime, but daily yeah, is mean exactly. from prime to three prime. Let us look. Hold on. Just let us look. So DNA, how is DNA? Made again? All right. So DNA is made what five to three, right? Yes, sir. All right. Remember that statement. Now let's look. So you say DNA is made five to three. So if DNA is opening a break, the new DNA that is being made, it is going to start here, right? And come in this direction. Excuse me, sir. Could you please repeat? So we are so we just agreed that when we are synthesizing a new strand of DNA, it is synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction. So we agreed that the DNA has opened up. When we are making the new strand, it will be made in this direction. Are we all agreeing on this? Yes, sir. <sighs> and, you, and you said that it is made five prime to three prime, right? Yes, sir. That is what you said. So DNA is being made in this direction. And you say it is being made five prime to three prime. That means the three prime end will be to this part. Good? And the five prime end out here. Now, look at your two strands of original DNA. Which one is anti-parallel to your new So Let me label this as my new strand. So your new strand is made five prime to three prime in the direction of the replication arc. So it is, you have to add in that part, you know. It is made five prime to three prime in the direction of the replication arc. So we are reading it from this direction to this direction. So you cannot read it three prime to five prime. So when this trend is finished, at no basis, um, I see you by are saying three to five for the new strand. But look at this. This is your new strand. Which of these strands are anti-parallel to it? This one or this one? The top one or the bottom the top one? one? The top the one. Anti-parallel, right? Good. And what direction is the top one? All right, two, three, three. Sorry, three to five. Who's a three to five? Five to three. Five to three. Right. So look, the top one, so I'm just clearing it up because I know it can cause confusion. They have five to three, right? And then you see your new strand. So your original strand is five to three. And then you see your new strand saying three to five. But remember, when you're making this strand, not when this strand is finished, when you're making this strand, it is made in a five prime to three prime direction when it is being made. So you're not going to look at your new strand that is being made and say three prime to five prime. Because when you're making this strand, you are reading it five prime to three prime. And that yes, is sir, it just, it's just dependent on the, um, the direction of the replication for it, like where you have the replication. Right, that is right. So that is what I'm saying. It's five prime to three prime in the direction of your replication torque. So, if this is your new strand being made five to three, this strand here, which is running five prime to three prime, is anti-parallel to it. Now, whatever is anti-parallel to your new strand to be your leading strand. I'm going to use the simplified version so you can see, so you can understand it a little better. 
Excuse me, sir. Somebody's mic is open and it's giving a feedback oh. and it's making it hard Come to in. hear. All right. Right. So the most confusing part about this probably is the is mentioning the leading strand running five three and saying that the new strand in synthesized five to three. So when you hear five to three, it might be confusing, but you have to look at the diagram to understand it, right? So your original strand is going five prime to three prime. Your new strand is being made five prime to three prime. Even though you hear both of them saying five prime to three prime, but it is in different direction because the new strand is going in the direction of the replication fork, whereas the leading strand is going opposite five to three that way. So both of them are anti-parallel to each other. And so you will see that DNA replication will be continuous. I'm going to use these two straight lines up here to try and make the explanation as simple and straightforward as possible and so that you can see it, all right? So I'm going to erase this diagram here. I'm also going to erase the three prime to five prime strand. Or uh, let me bring it down a little. So my new strand, right? So these strands were joined together. So the first thing we would have to do, helicase would, helicase would separate them. So both of our DNA strands are separated. This is the direction that we are synthesizing DNA from. So I'm, I'm going to work from the right side to the left side. That is how we're going to make our new DNA. And remember we said our new DNA is synthesized five prime to three prime. That means the five prime end will be here. And as you go along, the three prime end will be in front. So in the case, would have unwind your DNA. Then RNA primase would have laid down a primer. So DNA replication, so DNA polymerase, you cannot just attach to DNA and start the replication process. It needs a startup, right? Something has to initiate the process. And that is where the RNA primer comes in. So the first thing that happens after helicase unwinds your DNA is that the, an RNA primer is made. So we're putting down our RNA primer. Now, once the RNA primer is there, DNA polymer is now, you can attach and start adding complementary nucleotides. And then it will do that. It will just continue adding nucleotides until it reaches the end. Remember, DNA is made five prime to three prime. So when it is being made five prime to three prime, it is anti-parallel to this strand. And so it can be made in a continuous manner. All right, there's no hiccups here. Our, the DNA polymerase just attaches itself and adds complementary nucleotides until it reaches the end. The reason for that, in DNA, both strands are anti parallel to each other. Now, let's look at this strand here. Remember, DNA 5 to 3, right? So the 5 prime end would be here, and the 3 prime end would be here.
does this DNA sequence look correct? No, because they're not anti parallel. Exactly. And so, as a result of this. Uh, repeat the question. Yes. Please repeat. So I'm saying you should repeat the question you have just asked. Well, I was asking if the sequence in these two DNA strands, if they are correct, as in the ends, if, if it can stay as is. So we have two five prime N and two three prime N. Can it stay? No, sir. No. It should be anti-parallel. Exactly. And so, because it should be anti-parallel, and this cannot work, what happens is that when a portion of the DNA opens up, so the primer, you see, on this strand, the primer is placed at the end because DNA is already anti-parallel. But in this strand, DNA is not anti-parallel. And so what happens, the RNA primer, they cannot put it at the end. It is made, it is attached further down on the strand. And what is going to happen now? Remember, the DNA is being opened up in this direction, all right? But your strand is going to be made, as we said, five prime to three prime. But it is being made in an opposite direction to the replication for. So DNA is opened up in this direction. But the very DNA strand here is being synthesized in the opposite direction. So our new DNA is going in this direction, opposite to the, to the replication arc. All right, so DNA is being opened up by helicase in this direction, whereas the new DNA for this strand is being made in this direction. So this is your RNA primer again. So, poly so DNA polymerase three, DNA polymerase three, it will attach to the DNA and synthesize the new strand, all right? And so this end would be the five prime end, and this end would be the three prime end. So now you can see that both strands are what? Anti-parallel, correct? Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Sir. yes? All right, however, is the DNA replication process completed? No, sir. Sir. Because no, sir. Because we have more strands down here to be replicated. And as such, a new primer will have to be made again. And once the primer, so remember the DNA polymerase, it cannot start. They add in the nucleotides and kill you out an RNA primer. This RNA primer here was to synthesize this chunk, this segment. Once that is finished, more of your DNA would have opened up. And so replication needs to start again. So a next primer is made, and then DNA polymerase three will come again and, uh, and make or uh, synthesize this segment. So let me just color code the primer, all right? So the shaded area is the primer, and these are your DNA strands that are synthesized. Now, look at this strand. How many segments does it have? Remember, this is the primer, so it's not a segment. This one. new strand of DNA, how many segments does it have? One. It's continuous. Right, so one straight thing, right? Continuous. But this one, Based on this little section that I draw, how many sections or fragments does it have? Two. 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 The next question, when DNA polymerase attach itself, did it just synthesize the strand in one go? No, sir. No, sir. It stopped and it has to start again, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this strand 
will synthesize in a continuous manner, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One. So this trend of here, it was done in a continuous manner. And this one down here was done in a discontinuous manner. So remember, I'm going to highlight the those trends now. So at the end of it, I'm not finished with the, with the process as yet. But out here, you will have the five prime n and the three prime n. I'm going to highlight the original strands now with a red asterisk. So remember, these were our original strands right here. So looking at the original strand, which one was synthesized in a continuous manner? Five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime? So the five prime, five to, three prime, prime. to three prime. So which strand is the leading strand? Continuous. So the five prime to three prime. Exactly. And the discontinuous one is three prime to five prime. Which is login. Right. So just remember how to view it, right? DNA is made five prime to three prime. But the leading strand, and here is if I if you say it without looking at the diagram, that is really confusing. So the leading strand runs five prime to three prime. DNA is made five prime to three prime. If you say it like that, you will think they are both going in the same direction, but they are not. When you look at the diagram here now. You see that one is going five to three in this direction, whereas the other one is going five to three in a different direction. So just saying it might make you think they're going in the same direction, and so they would be anti, and so they would have been parallel. But you have to remember one is already set in five to three, and one is being made five to three, so they are anti-parallel. So that is sir, why, yes? Sir, in, um, in the lagging strand, sir, um, when when the polymer is three, um, is adding the complementary base, bases or complementary strands, or if you want to say that, um, would the direction of it be going opposite um, to the direction of the replication fork? That is correct. And it has to do with that because, as I was showing you, if you try to go in the direction of the replication fork, if you try to go in the direction of the replication fork, you would end up with the five prime n being here and the three prime n being here. And so you would end up with the strands being the same as three prime meeting with three prime n five prime meeting with five prime. And so to avoid this, this trend has to be made opposite to the replication fork. All right, sir. Yes. So sir, isn't, um, sir, with that being said, sir, um, should we make it a standard for us to say that um, the polymerase enzyme will always read from the three prime to five prime direction? Like this, just think like we just stop and think of it. Like it, it depends on replication fork, but um, the direction of replication fork. So I mean, I'm thinking that before that, before this DNA was unwinded, um, we have the three prime to five prime. You must have like a five prime to three prime, but depending on the replication fork direction thingy, mm -hmm. you get what I'm saying, sir? Are are confused or? No, you see. When you mention the direction, so it doesn't matter. So first, right? Let's forget about the replication for a little. DNA, when it's being made, it's always going to be from a five prime end to a three prime end. That's how it's set, all right? It's always going to be made five prime to three prime. Now DNA must 
open up, right? So if it opens up like this, right? The, the strand is going to be made five to three in the direction in which DNA is open. So if DNA is open like this, and this end is three prime. So if this end is three prime, your DNA is going to be made five to three. So the five prime end of your new DNA would align with the three prime end. And so this will be the leading strand. Let's flip it now, all right? And let's say it opens in this direction. And this is still five to three, right? DNA, the new one, is going to be made in that direction. So if this is five to three, or even if this one is five to three, the five prime end of the new DNA will align with the three prime end. And this would be your leading strand. So when, right. Yeah, so when yes, the DNA sir, opens up, all right, go ahead. All right, sir, I want you to like, um, for more, like a scenario, can you just use the can you pull up the marker, sir? Like the rep, you know, the thing with the marker, sir, is mm -hmm. so, sir. Let's say if the if the red marker um was like three prime at the, at the, at the beginning of the no mm -hmm. no yeah. The, yeah three prime to five prime yeah. right? But know that right. the DNA right. polymerase is going to work in the same direction as the replication for if it's open, right? Right. right. So right. let's say you no know, the black marker is mm -hmm. five prime at the at the yeah. One part here yeah, to right. three prime, and the mm -hmm. DNA polymerase is going to be add is going to add the complementary strand, um, opposite to the to the direction of the replication fork. So instead of going down, going come up. Yes, it will come up for the lagging one. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, that's, right. that's 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 the imagery I wanted to to like. Have yeah, definitely. So, right. So for this strand. Let's say th this is the DNA polymerase, right? If this is the leading strand, DNA polymerase it would be coming down. While for the lagging one, it would be coming out. So when this portion of the of the, the DNA opens up, it would the primer would be here, and then it may come to the end. But then more of the DNA will open up, right? And so the primer would be made further down again and synthesized come up. Understand? All right. So before yes, the, the phone is on, what is about 4%, so let us just continue till it dies. All right. So, and then I will upload it. So let us look at the enzyme again. So we have DNA helicase. Repeat exactly. Ligase. Speak. All right, so we have helicase, which is to do what? So unwind the DNA. Unwind the DNA. Unwind the DNA. Unwind the DNA. Unwind It is breaking the hydrogen bonds, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. The, the DNA opens up. Yes, it will be saved, I'm assuming. All right, let us just wrap quickly. <laughs> All right, let us do All right, so DNA, it unwinds, right? And then, yes, now we need, and then we need to make a primer. So a primer is added to both strands. Once the primer is added, then DNA polymer is free. It can go along now and attach the complementary nucleotides. All right? So my phone was on 40 when I started, and it's about two. Now. All right, so the is there. RNA premise comes and synthesizes the new strand. All right. However, with the other strand, because it is not, it is not in an anti-parallel direction, replication cannot start at the end. So the primer is placed further down. So the primer is not placed at the end. It is placed further down on the strand. Then your DNA polymerase will synthesize it in a direction opposite to the fork. All right. When it is completed with that section, more of the DNA is opened up. 
So we have to make a new primer. And so between the two primers now, there's a section of DNA that must be synthesized. And this will continue until the entire strand of DNA is synthesized. That is what DNA polymerase three does. We also have DNA polymerase one. That will now come and remove the RNA primer. All right, because we cannot have RNA in our DNA. So we will remove the RNA, right? And replace it with DNA. And then our fragments, which we call what? Okazaki fragments, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is where DNA ligase now will come in and join up the fragments. Yes. Right? Sir, so you're saying the fragments is a space in between the the, the strands that would have been filled or the strands. Right. So, right. so we remove the, the RNA, put in DNA, and seal up everything. So we get one C strand. So we use helicase, DNA polymerase 3, DNA polymerase 1, and ligase, DNA ligase in our DNA replication, all right? So I'm going to have to stop the recording here. Remember, I'm going to look for some past papers. So in the morning, as we come, we just start. Sir, chop your chop with sir, watch on sir. Hey, so no, just no, follow, all I know to have no sir.